How's it going guys? Welcome back to another episode of Design Patterns. Today we're going to be looking at the bridge design pattern. I'm going to talk about it briefly here before we get started, but I'd like to just jump in and show you the example because I think it'll make a lot more sense. As this one, although it's sort of simple once you do it, it's a little hard to kind of understand uh, based on the language usually used to describe it, which is something like this. Uh, decouple an abstraction from its implementation so that the two can vary independently. All right, we'll, we'll unpack that, don't worry. And uh, let's see, what else do they say about it? Publish an interface in an inheritance hierarchy and bury the implementation in its own inheritance hierarchy. I'm finding this on uh, sourcemaking.com slash design patterns, not sponsored. That's just where I'm pulling this particular lingo. And so what we're gonna do here basically is consider a case where the normal inheritance structure doesn't work quite right anymore. So let me give you an example, and we're gonna do this with a set of classes like an RPG, uh, so some of you might like that. All right, so I've already done all the CMake stuff as we do at the beginning of every episode, just added it to those, uh, added a new project, called it Bridge PC, and we're gonna start adding some files. I have a main here that's completely empty. Let's go ahead and just make an int main, and we're gonna talk about it as we go. But first I'd like to give you the first part of this example. Consider the case of we add, we wanna add a player, all right? We wanna have whatever RPG game system we're making here. Uh, we're kind of starting from the bare bones and we wanna have a player. So we want them to be able to do some special things like we want them to be able to select their class or their specialty rather, or how they're gonna level up, their level path, if you will. And we also want them to be able to choose what race of the available races. And we'll just start with that. That's gonna be enough for this example. So we want a player, we want them to be able to pick their class and race. And it, this might sort of come to you naturally, and if it does, great. But the problem that people run into, and you know, maybe this is a bit of a contrived, simpler example, but it could really be for anything if you're having this happen. So we're gonna make a player .h, just a little player cache here. And let's put our pragma once up at the top. Let's go class, player, all right, so if a player can have a, a race, we think, okay, so maybe we want a class for that, too, like a race class. And I'm not gonna fill these out yet. I'm just kind of making the example first. And we also want a, uh, well, I can't call the class class because uh, that doesn't work too well. I guess it does if you do it with capital C. Yeah, that's fine, okay. So you want a race in a class. And you might think it, you could just do something like this. Just have a public race and a public class. And we're ready to go. The player's got both. But this has a problem because at runtime, uh, we, we, won't, we won't be able to change the race. We won't be able to change the class. So that's the big issue here. Uh, we, if we did, we'd have to do something like enum uh, class type or something. And put all our class types in an enum or something like that we'd have to like do it in this sort of fashion and it would get very very messy and big you could do it but the bridge is made to solve this problem because you essentially you'd have to do this with the race too and eventually you just got all these types and well this isn't the worst but what happens here eventually um, i'll just make a few uh like unpicked dwarf elf what else are we going to put in here dwarf and elf is fine um, let's add gnome, dwarf elf gnome. And we could do the same thing here for classes. What classes do we want? Well, let's just do fighter, wizard, rogue, or I'm going to call it warrior, warrior, wizard, rogue. All right. So you could, you could design these in a way where you could modify them, but where the real problem comes in is when you want to add another one, say you want to make a little expansion pack later or decide to update your code. And you just, after you've done a whole bunch of stuff, uh, throughout these classes modifying this um like maybe you've got special switch cases that allow you to pick these and same for these and then at some point you decide okay uh we're suddenly going to add the monk class and then you've got to update all your switch statements every all your choose logic there's going to be a whole cascade of things you have to update just to add one class later if you didn't have it all premeditated and ready to go, which let's face it, there's always going to be an expansion to anything that, you, you know, it's just the way it goes. So there's a better way of making this more maintainable because yeah, while you could do it this way, this way gets just 
real ugly real fast is from a maintainability standpoint. So I hope I'm making that clear because, yes, you can do it with whatever way you manage to come up with, but if you want to do it in a way that's easy to expand later, and I'll prove it to you as we go that it's easy to expand later, well, let me give you a, a show of that. All right, so instead of having all this, just get rid of these, get rid of this, and we'll do it a different way. And get rid of this. Player doesn't need to inherit from these, but rather, instead of inheriting, we'll just make them composed in the class. So we'll have a race pointer, and we'll just underscore race. There's that. And the same with this. So it's just going to be better to have them composed in this case. And I'm going to show you how to build this all up. So we do need an interface for the race in the class. All right, let's make our own, own files for these. Make race and... I guess I could call it class. Using the keyword class is, is a bit touchy, so we got to be careful with that. But we'll we'll manage. Okay. So we'll just delete these for now. We'll leave player alone. We'll come back to player. Of course, we're going to. We know we're going to need to include race and class. So let's go ahead and get that in there. And I'm going to go kind of deep here. I'm going to uh, do quite a bit of coding and get into this because for once I have prepared before. So. I shouldn't fumble too much. Buckle up. If you'd like to support me, please consider joining the channel or the Patreon. Or if you can find me on GitHub, you can support me on there as well. It means a lot for continuing these episodes. I'm going to try to my darndest to release a video every Wednesday this year. Um, the only foreseeable reason I think that I might give up mid-year is if things keep downtrending. Because, uh, you know, after the holidays, a lot of things kind of tanked a bit. And it's, uh, it's a bit rough, and I'm, I am developing a game on my own, so a lot of my time goes into that. So it does take a good bit of my energy to switch gears and do these videos, so I just kind of want to make sure I'm actually focused where I should be focused. So your support means a ton. Seeing, seeing that stuff makes a big difference, so consider liking, sharing, whatever you want to do, even if you're just leaving me good feedback. That's often good too, or leaving a comment and all that stuff. So we're looking for a nice positive 2023, and... Uh, yeah, I guess uh, we'll go from there. Look forward to 52 videos, and if there's any updates, I'll post them in future videos. So that's all I wanted to say about that stuff. Appreciate you guys that do support me, and future people that do. It means a lot. All right, so we got a player. We got a race and a class composed in here. Now, how do we make these races and classes properly? Let's show that. These are the ones that are going to have the inheritance structure because... Well, this one, let's, uh, let's do the class first. We want to uh, hold fragment one, and we want the default, default class. This is the interface. So naturally, we're going to do what we require here. You want a virtual destructor. We'll just make it default. That is required for these pure virtual classes. And we need a virtual function of some sort here. All right, now that I'm out of that toasty robe, I should be able to focus a little bit better here. So we're just going to make a, I guess we'll make a get class. And we get class name here. And that one is just going to equal zero because we want to override that. And we'll also make another one for, let's see here. Well, thinking ahead a little bit, classes are going to need a resource. So we'll get, we'll get resource or resource name rather. Kind of going to take some inspiration from several different games here as far as how this is designed. A little bit of World of Warcraft with the resource because I'm thinking the wizard's going to have a mana bar, the warrior's going to have a rage bar, and the rogue is going to have an energy bar. So since they're all going to basically have a bar, we only really need the name. Later we will handle the stats. All right, let's see. Is there anything else we need? Well, uh, at some point, we're going to need to figure out stats, but we'll do that a little later. So this is an interface here. Very good. And we want to just put in whatever classes we want to support. we got a warrior. And to start, we could just implement these functions here. Oh, let's make sure they actually return something. These are just going to return strings. That's fine for now. Make sure we include string. Okay. And we'll actually... Go ahead and, and do what they do. Override, return, this class name is just going to be warrior. Simple enough there. And the resource name, we're going to return that as rage. And this is going to be useful later, as you'll find out. So we also want to think about how else this warrior wants to operate. 
So we're going to have a constructor that does maybe something special for warriors for like the warrior defaults. All right, and we're going to do the same for any other classes we want. We'll start out with the core three. All right, warrior, wizard, change this to mana. Cool, there's a wizard. And we can go on and we'll do the rogue here. Rogue uses energy. All right, and there we go. We've got a nice dynamic class. We've got an interface that the player already has. So we could set, we could already set this to any of those three and we could change it at runtime if we wanted. So that's awesome. We, the, the problem with doing it with pure inheritance is it's stuck at compile time. And well, if that doesn't work for you and you're trying to think of a solution, it's probably this bridge. And we're basically going to do the same thing with race. We'll just make a get race name as the virtual. And that's good enough for now. And we just want to put all our races in here. We had dwarf we were considering. Oh, we do need to make sure we inherit from this stuff. Uh, did I do that with the class? No, I totally forgot to do that. So we'll just get all that in there. Inheritance is pretty important there. And then same with the race. We want a constructor here. And we want the overridden function. And we're just going to make a couple of these. Uh, we're going to make one for elf. And we'll make another one for gnome. All right, and this is enough of an example to at least pick a race in a class dynamically and even change them if you want. I had a bit more worked up that is not entirely relevant to the example, but just kind of shows you how to expand it. Because right now, basically what you could do is you could go player, instructor here, have it take a race, and have it take a class. Uh, we can't use the keyword class here with lowercase, so that's kind of tricky. We'll just make it a C. And whenever you instantiate a player, you just set it to that. And then we can go over to our main, include player here. That includes everything else we need already. And we can implement a player, say player one, and it wants a race in a class. So uh, we could, as you can see here, it's going to accept this default constructor unless we delete it. Um, so it depends on the intention of your program. In our case, uh, we are going to delete this one. Or you could make it private or something. Now, this actually does require that we do more stuff. Check out my rule of three and rule of five video if you're not sure. But I'm going to kind of skip over that for now. But we at least want to stop them from default constructing this. But if you want, you can get fancy and apply that stuff if you're actually going to use this code or parts of this code. So at this point, we could go back over to our main and go ahead and implement it. Now, you might notice here that we're going to need a class and a race implemented somewhere. These are just pointers. We could have this class be the owner of these pointers, but then if we do that, we need to make sure it deletes them. However, since it's dynamic and at runtime, most likely what we want to do is just have some defaults of these sitting around because if you think about it, there might be a bunch of players or you might make a version of this for NPCs and they might also want the race in the class. And you don't have to uh, put it a, a bunch of the races in there and a bunch of classes. Like you don't, you don't want to put 15 dwarves in memory because you only need the stats and the stuff from the dwarves once. Does that make sense? Hopefully. That's kind of another point here uh, because if you go like this in every single one of them, then every time you make a player, or if this were an NPC or, you know, just some monster or something, every time you make one of those, you're also going to be making these, which just takes up more memory and it's completely unnecessary. That's sort of a side point of the bridge, but just something that's kind of important to realize because basically somewhere in your your program if you're running this there's going to be you know you want to preload stuff you see that at the beginning of every big program is it has some kind of loading bar and the reason is it's just preparing resources so we'll have a, a dwarf and we'll just call this default i guess uh, we'll just call it lowercase dwarf that's fine i thought about calling it default dwarf and you just want to give them the default instantiation and we'll do the same with all of them for all these. I guess I'll just type it out. Default gnome. Okay, we've got to default everything. All these need to be pointers, of course. These don't necessarily have to be pointers, but if they're not pointers, you want to make sure that you use the reference symbol, like we showed in the last video. All right, so say player one gets their selection and they get to choose a race, and maybe they choose dwarf, and they get to choose a class. So let's uh, go ahead and prepare these classes as well. 
So now that we have these all on the heap ready to go, we can just let the people choose them and we don't have to do any additional loading. We're just gonna, just gonna use it. Maybe it's a dwarf. We'll go with the classic dwarf warrior. All right, there's player one being a dwarf warrior. So yeah, what we're gonna see is if we do some, some standard CL stuff is that it's a dwarf and a warrior because it's of course gonna pull from these if we call get race name and uh, get class name and we can also get the resources. So if you've got the gist of it from here, great. But consider how this would work with other things. Basically, anytime you've got something that could change at runtime, um, or you want to set it as the program runs, this is a great place for this. You could do this with the, your graphic API, for example, if you want to allow your user to change between um, Vulkan, OpenGL, DirectX. You could just have a you could have it composed in your main thing that's tying everything together, and then that way they could just pick one, and it's going to boot up all the resources for that. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great case. You can really do it for anything. There's some classic examples like a light switch. Um, you know, they all do the th same thing. They do a toggle on and off. Some of them have a dimmer, but it doesn't have to be a flipper switch. It could be a pull string. You know, you, you could implement a different one. So there's a lot of other examples out there is the point. And I don't want you to walk away from this thinking this is the only way to do it or something, but it is generally... As we go. Okay, I'm going to move on because this is part two of the video and this is where I just fancy this up a little bit and do some some printing uh, of the classes and we're going to do some cool stuff. So I hope you stick around, but I've kind of expected most people to probably not stick around much longer once they got the gist of it, but we're going to do the cool part now. So, all right, basically we're going to add stats to this and we're going to make it a bit dynamic so that it actually works a bit like an RPG. And we're gonna do it rather quickly just based on this smart design. So the first thing we wanna do is add stats. Let's go ahead and just add a stats file. But it's important to realize that this stats is kind of a side thing. It's not directly related to the bridge pattern, but we want it because our program wants it. We're gonna make a class called stats. And uh, actually I think I'm just gonna copy in from what I had earlier. Yeah, here we go. I'm just gonna copy all this in and I'll explain. Okay, so we have a header here of stats, and here's the stats. We have power, agility, and mental. Those are the three main stats we're gonna pull from, just keeping it simple. And we also have a max HP and a max resource. That's all we need. And since uh, we're gonna use the type def of this because, well, it's gonna simplify things. This is an old C style thing, but basically it allows us to, to not run into the multiple instantiation problem at times. So make the struct, do the type def struct, and then the name of it twice. I know it seems odd. Don't worry about it. Just that's how you got to do it sometimes. All right. We also want to make an operator to easily add two stats together. So we're just going to overload or uh, not overload. We're just going to make this operator for plus equals on stats. It takes a left hand side and a right hand side that's const. Returns the left hand side after adding to it because that's what plus equals does. And there it all is. And uh, we're just going to make an init stats. Um, obviously they start at zero but that's kind of for some initial calculations. Um, when we're running later, we're gonna use this in his stats. And all it does is set power, agility, and mental to one, max HP and max resource to 100. So uh, that's it for the stats. So now we're gonna make use of those and put them in the class here a little bit. So every class comes with some asso associated stats. Uh, we need to make sure we include this. And yeah, there's gonna be some other C++ stuff that comes up. So you might learn a few things. So we're just going to have stats here. Public's fine. Make sure we initialize it with uh, those brackets. And we can say now when you implement a warrior, we're going to plus up some stats. Like maybe the, the warrior starts out with one bonus to the stats. So we're going to go stats.power, or yeah, plus equals one. And stats. Let's go max HP plus equals two get a little bonus power and HP just for being a warrior. And we'll do similar things for the wizard and rogue. We'll just give them various different stats here. So another great thing about this is this stuff changes very easily at runtime. So we'll, we'll, I'll talk about that a little more here shortly. But we're going to give the wizard some plus up to the mental and maybe some plus up to the resource. And we'll give the rogue something too. Agility, naturally. Let's go on with ones. And anything else we should give this guy? Maybe we'll give them... Nah, let's just give him two agility. Okay. So, there we go. Now we have some, 
specific stat differentiation here. And we're going to do a similar thing with race. Race is also going to come with some stats. Make sure we include stats. And we can say, okay, what did dwarves get? We could give them a bit more power. Maybe they get one bonus power. And stat, they're not, dwarves are pretty resilient, so let's give them some more HP as well. Now, it seems pretty obvious right now that they make really great warriors with all this extra power and HP. Um, we'll just give them, like, two. Let's not go overboard. And we'll do something for the elves, too. Give them some agility, and I guess that's it. Let's just give them one agility. So if we were doing a real game, we might have a lot more stats to consider, like move speed, action points, all this stuff. Um, so... That's why these are going to look unbalanced, because there's a lot of other things that could be a factor that we're just not putting in here. Uh, let's give gnomes some mental power. Gnomes are smart. All right, so that seems pretty good. Let's nerf the HP on the dwarf. All right, that's that's fine. The format button looks good. And you might ask why I'm using plus equals here. Well, it doesn't really matter, I guess. We could just set it to equals, but... I just want to make sure it's adding for future proofing stuff, basically. Uh, because if we're potentially changing this in multiple places, if we keep expanding Dwarf later, then we want to make sure they're accumulating and not uh, resetting, if that makes sense. So if we set, you know, plus one power for this factor, plus one power for this factor, if we were using just equals, then we would just be setting it to one every time and they wouldn't be accumulating. So that's why I'm using the plus equals. Here. It's just to be a little future proof. Another great thing about this pattern is, well, as we if we go and change stuff about these, the client here, this main being considered the client, well, this whole file, they don't need to do anything differently. So if we go and update this piece of software and say, hey, we rebalanced the race or whatever, or the classes, the client wouldn't need to do anything. Whereas with the method I was showing at the very beginning, they might have to do all kinds of special stuff because that one involved a lot of code and a lot of kind of workarounds to make things work. Okay, let's keep going with the stats now. We want the player to have a main stats block here. So we're just going to put that in here. Uh, stats. Stats. And we're going to add a few other things to the player while we're at it. We're going to make a string of just the, the character name. Might as well put that in there. And we're going to add that to the constructor. You need a race, a class, and a character name. And we'll make sure we set that character name. Now when we go to this implementation, we're going to need a name here. I'm going to pull up a little DM Power program here. Go to my tools here, name generator. There we go. Car. That's a great dwarf name, dwarf warrior name. So that's all sorted out. Um, we just want to make sure that with this player, that we do all these stats. Because, you know, we got some stats for the race, we get some for the class, we just want to make sure we add them to this. So first of all, let's call that function init stats on this one specifically. Notice that we didn't call it on the others. There's a reason for that. And we want to pass in these stats. Now this is by reference, so it's going to modify it. We can go look at this function. There it is. It basically just, yeah, we already went over that. Sets them to something other than zero. Some better defaults, if you will. So we got at least some ones and some base stuff. Now let's add all this other stuff to it. Um, the race and the class. And we can do that using the plus equals, since we've already got this prepared over here in stats.h, just to go along with it. Uh, so... Kind of got the extensions ready to go there, which is nice. So basically, we can just go stats plus equals race stats. And then also add in the class ones. Make sure we actually put the word class here. And then our, our stats should be all up to date. We're not doing leveling in here, of course, but that's something you would want to add if you're going in for real. All right. So now that this is basically done, the last thing we want to do is just get a nice printout. I'm going to make a class here called player underscore sheet. And this is just going to handle all the printing. Um, I've already made this file earlier. Um, basically, we just want to include the player, of course, and include IO stream because we're going to need that. And we're going to use a little bit of IO manip to make it look a little nicer. And now I could type this all in, but I did it a few hours ago, so I was going to paste it all over, and then we'll go through it line by line and explain what it does. All right, so it's just a function called print player sheet. 
doesn't return anything. It takes a const reference to a player. That's const because it's not going to modify the player and definitely don't want it to. So const is great. And we're just doing some console outs here. Uh, we're doing name and grabbing the character name. Race, calling the get race name out of the race that's set. S same with class, except it's get class name, I believe. Is that what we called it? Oh, wait. Okay, I've got some f a few changes here. I was calling it spec and path in the uh, previous thing I wrote up. But now it's all just class. So it's going to show the class. And I notice I'm kind of doing some specific spacing here uh, on this section just to make it line up nicely. And now here we have the resource name. Now the resource name is dynamic. It could be mana, it could be rage, it could be uh, energy. So we don't know how wide it's gonna be. So we're using left alignment and setting the width to eight because that is the width of the greatest one of these is eight. So we're just using a little bit of those uh, there, getting the spec name and uh, just putting printing out the resources. We did the same with HP. We're just doing a, the current slash max, current slash max on the resource. Notice that it's always just current resource, no matter which one. You don't have to say get rage or get energy. It's just always going to be get resource. Uh, the only thing that changes is the name, but you still always just call get resource name. Now this is nice because from a client end, that code's never going to change, no matter how many things you mod in later. All right, then power, agility, mental. All right, good enough. So what we can do now is go back to our main and just call that function. Well, we need to make sure we include it. Include player sheet and call it. And there is going to be a slight problem here, but I'll show you how to address that to print player sheet of player one. All right, I think we got to update our CMake here. Make sure it's got all these files in here. Okay, now it should work a little better. Okay, but it still has a problem here. Well, we don't see it here. But when we go to compile it, it's going to complain that some of this stuff is private and it can't be accessed. Now, if we hover over it, this ID is helping. It says has declared and it's inaccessible. Um, it's, it's private. So what do we do? Do we start making a bunch of getters? Well, we could. I don't really want to do that, though. Or there's another option that C++ offers. We can just make that specific print function a friend. So we can go friend. And then we just put the function signature here. Void print player sheet. And then take the cons reference to this class. And that's it. Now this should be happy about that. It should be okay with the player sheet accessing these private members since it's a friend. Our current HP, did I name it something different? Oh, I, I didn't add that in. So yes, there should also be int current HP here int current resource and it should stall all start at zero i could put it we could put it in the constructor but we could also just put it right here and it'll essentially be the same as putting it in the constructor but it's a good idea to make sure things are initialized okay there we go got all that initialized now in theory we could put this current hp and resource into the stat block but the thing is it doesn't really work too well with the way we're doing it because um each race doesn't want a current HP and each stat doesn't want a current HP and stuff like that. They just maybe want to add to the max. So that's why we only have the maxes in here. Uh, just a design choice there. So it's specifically with the player. But now that should make our player sheet a little bit happier. Uh, I think if we call this something else, get resource name. Oh, it's, it's in, there's no spec. There we go. Okay. So we should be able to run this and we should get a printout of player one. Let's go ahead and have a go. And there it is. There's Gurkar, the Dwarf Warrior, 103 HP max, 0 out of 100 rage, 3 power, 1 agility, 1 mental. All right, super cool. So can we do that with the rest? Sure can. All right, let's give it a try. Player 2. Let's make this an elf wizard. And we need another name. Let me pull up my program, get another random name here. Kimbley. Cool name. Call this print. Let's type it in there, change that to a 2. Now we should see Kimberly in there as well. There's Kimberly, different stats as expected, and we could keep going on and on. I might as well do a gnome at it, right? Player three, gnome. Actually, let's make Kimberly a rogue and the gnome wizard something else. Let's find another name here. Glidrin. That sounds like an elf name. Okay, that's going to be the elf name. Kimberly's going to be the, the gnome. Eh, whatever. Doesn't matter. We'll just go with it. Make sure we print player three, and we should see the gnome wizard, and we're going to see that the elf is now rogue. 
There we go. They are all in there, all with different stats, as expected. Look at that agility. Oh, very nice. Okay, so now what's super cool about this is, uh, well, a couple, couple things you might notice. Like if we make another player, player four, for example, we reuse gnome and we reuse warrior. Let's get another random name, Winessa. Winessa? That's a weird name. It'll work just fine and it'll get all the right stuff. And notice that we don't have to reinstantiate gnome. There's still just one gnome in memory or one gnome stats. So with this kind of method, you can you can design a system where you can make great use of uh, what do they call that pattern? The flyweight. That's what I was trying to think of. Make great use of a fly, which is essentially where you only implement or uh, put something in memory once and just keep reusing. So it's a great way to make use of the flyweight while you're at it too. Okay, so super cool. Okay, so now you I told you we would expand it later and show you how easy it is whereas remember at the beginning of the video to expand it we would have had to you know in theory change a bunch of switch statements modify a bunch of things it would have got really messy it would have been a, just a huge overhead to make one little change like let's say we want to add the monk class all right we want to be able to go okay well what about monk it'd be so cool to have a monk in the game uh how much work do we have to do to put in a monk and this is where the beauty of this pattern really comes in you just go over to race or not race class just go over to class Put a monk in here put in whatever you want he uses key sure he gets uh one agility one mental and maybe we'll just you know kind of make the monk class a little broken let's let's give his max hp also a little buff there we go that simple we now have a monk and the client can just instantly use it that's so much less overhead oh, let's make a uh dwarf monk player five let's get a new name skerak Skak the monk. Sweet. Alright, hit play. Bam, monk added. And there's the monk. So it's that simple to make uh, modifications. We could do the same for races. If we wanted to just add another race, we could just pop it in there and just, there we go. So, as you can see, there's a reason why this is a design pattern. It's very, very maintainable and it's very nice. So that's it for this video. Hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to hit the buttons. Consider supporting the channel if you want to keep seeing stuff like this. It would mean a ton to me and, uh, yeah, and the community. All right. See you guys next time. Peace.